And congratulations, you've reached the final part of this presentation, congenital disorders, neuroradiological signs, and old minis. So these are the signs and old minis I'm going to talk about in this presentation, and they will involve molar tooths, pancakes, race cars, and various animals, including, as you can see, uh, dragonflies. Let's start with this, however. This is a patient with a genetic disorder called lysencephaly. And on this actual T1-weighted image, we see, first of all, that the brain looks extremely smooth. We see hardly any sulci or gyri in this brain. And if we look at the configuration, we can recognize a figure of eight or an um, hourglass, uh, which is why this morphology is called the figure of eight sign or the hourglass sign. So this is a rare disorder. It's also a genetic disorder. Um, and it's basically caused by a failure of, mi uh, of migration of the developing neurons from the periventricular zone to their final region in the cerebral cortex. And this thick bond is just a layer of arrested migrating neurons. So we see this very thick cortex. This is abnormally thick, uh, abnormally thick because the neurons have not reached their final position. Uh, because there is no organization of the cortex, there are no sulci, there are no gyri, and at best we have some rudimentary development of the sylvian fissure leading to a figure of eight or our class sign. This is another sign that I believe is uh, something we all know or should know as radiologists something in this patient is missing. I think everybody immediately recognizes, even if you don't know this entity, something is abnormal. The ventricular morphology looks abnormal, both on this axial T1-weighted image and on this coronal T2-weighted image. What is the reason for that? Well, something is missing, something is absent. And if you look at the sagittal T1-weighted images, it is immediately clear what is missing, namely the corpus callosum, the thick white matter bundle connecting both cerebral hemispheres completely absent in this patient. This is called callosal agenesis. And um, the absence of this white matter, uh, white matter bundle leads to an abnormal configuration of the uh, ventricles, both in the axial plane and the coronal plane. In the axial plane, we get what is called the racing car sign. And here you have two racing cars. Basically, the third ventricle located over here is the actual car. And then we have the frontal horns and the, uh, the trigonum and the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles, which correspond to the wheels. So if you look at that, you can kind of recognize a racing car in there, I believe. And then we have the morphology of of the third ventricle and lateral ventricles and the coronal plane. And this one goes under many names. Let's go over them all. Well, first of all, what is missing normally, this here, we see here these two white matter uh, bundles, these should be connected to one another. And then it's the corpus callosum. But because there is no corpus callosum, white matter has developed into two thick bundles running uh, medially of the lateral ventricles causing this bizarre morphology and these are called the probes bundles so these are basically the axons that want to cross the midline but they can't so then they just run medially of the uh, lateral ventricles and this gives rise to various signs we can liken the uh, appearance of the third ventricle and then here the lateral ventricles to either a moose head eh? there is clearly a moose head appearance we can liken it to a steer horn or steer horns the steer horn appearance now for some reason just comparing it to a steer horn isn't sufficient for some people probably texans who rather see a texas longhorn in this um, coronal view, then we have the buffalo head appearance, and we even have a Viking helmet appearance, despite the fact that, historically speaking, Viking helmets didn't have horns. It was Richard Wagner who introduced these kind of helms in his operas, and as a consequence, we are stuck with this idea that the ancient Germans or the Vikings wore helmets shaped like this, but they didn't. So Viking helmet appearance, in my opinion, is historical 
historically a completely incorrect term. Let's move on to another disorder, also a rare disorder, but once again a disorder with a very typical appearance on imaging studies. Let's look at the midbrain in this patient. We've examined the midbrain in patients with progressive supranuclear palsy. This patient has something completely else. We see that the patient has quite thick and quite longitude, uh, horizontally orientated uh, superior cerebellar peduncles. This makes the midbrain look a bit like a molar tooth, and we call this the molar tooth sign. The molar tooth sign is described in a rare genetic disorder called Joubert syndrome. Joubert syndrome is characterized by both the molar tooth appearance of the midbrain on axial images and dysplasia of the cerebellar verbis. So if you have the combination of both these findings, this is very suggestive for this rare autosomal recessive disorder called Joubert syndrome, in which patients typically present uh, shortly um, at an early age, often shortly after birth already, with hypotonia, ataxia, oculomotor apraxia, rapid shallow breathing, and other symptoms. So this is Joubert syndrome, it's a ciliopathy. And then we have an other disorder, also a genetic disorder, can be caused by various kinds of mutations. We see the child on the left, we see a child on the right. The child on the right is a normal child, and the child on the left, we see atrophy of both the pons and the cerebellum if we compare it to the normal child. So when discussing pediatric cases, I often like to compare it with normal children to better see the pathology. This is the imaging hallmark of a genetic disorder or basically a group of genetic disorders called pontocerebellar hypoplasia. These are often severe. These children, the diagnosis, it is often quite clear at birth or after birth that these children have something going on and they often do not grow old, unfortunately. And the coronal plane, the appearance of the hypoplastic cerebellum in combination with the vermis that can look a bit more preserved is sometimes likened to a dragonfly sign or a dragonfly. So here we have, a, we have the vermis and here we have the very flat dysplastic cerebellar hemispheres and the end result is a so-called dragonfly. The next sign I would like to discuss with you is a so-called transmental sign. This is a sign described in focal cortical dysplasia. Focal cortical dysplasia is a uh, cortical malformation. It involves the cerebral cortex and often leads to epilepsy. And because the cortex typically originates or because neurons are typically formed near the ventricles, these abnormal neurons have to migrate to this region where they then organize abnormally. And we often see a line of scar tissue indicating the migration path of this abnormal cortex. This is called the transmental sign. This is also an important sign. First of all, it can help you detect a focal cortical dysplasia because these cortical malformations can be very subtle. Here it is a bit less subtle. We see clear thickening of the cortex in the depth of a sulcus, but nevertheless, it's not really in your face and your face is it so if you then see the transmental sign going from the ventricle to the cortex this is really really helpful and also because in some cases there is a lot of confusion could this be like a tumor or is it a malformation now the implications can be huge in terms of therapy and follow-up but if you see a transmental sign this is more suggestive for a cortical malformation for a focal cortical dysplasia and a similar sign has been described in a genetic disorder called tuberous sclerosis. Tuberous sclerosis is one of the phacomatoses. Those are uh, genetic disorders that lead both to skin abnormalities and neurological abnormalities. And these patients in their brain often have so-called tubers involving the cortex and the subcortical region. So we see these abnormalities immediately underneath the cortex. And then we have a thin line going to the ventricle. This is called a radial band sign. And it's probably uh, a bit similar to the line of scar tissue and a focal cortical dysplasia. This patient has multiple of these radial band signs, as you can see. So that makes focal cortical dysplasia less likely because that's not often multifocal. And the patient has other hallmarks of tuber sclerosis, like here, a so-called subependymal nodule, which is also typically seen in patients with tuber sclerosis. This brings us to another very classic appearance of a rare entity. This is 
is a patient with craniosynostosis. So this is a baby in whom the sutures have prematurely closed, leading to the development of an abnormal skull morphology. And in this case, the skull looks like a clover leaf, which is why we call this the clover, clover leaf skull. And Practically almost all sutures have fused in this child. This is a pancake brain, and this is, I believe, the final sign of this presentation. Also infrequently seen, it is uh, associated with a rare uh, fusion abnormality, or rather uh, cleavage abnormality uh, of the brain called holoprosencephaly. Holoprosencephaly can have various degrees of severity. This is the most severe kind called a lober holoprosencephaly. And what happens in these patients? Well, basically, uh, we start with um, the telencephalon originates embryologically as one vesicle that has to split in two vesicles. And when it does that, it's called the telencephalon. If it doesn't happen, you get holoprosencephaly. So this patient has an unfused telencephalon and diencephalon. We see a large monoventricle, which communicates with the CSF space over here. And you can ask yourself, why do they call it the pancake brain? I don't really see it, but maybe it's better seen in these very extreme cases that were diagnosed anti uh, prenatally this is a fetal mri and uh, it's also called a pancake brain sign because we basically just see a very thin uh, rim of residual brain or brain rather lining the skull it's as thin as a pancake which is why it's called pancake brain sign okay that concludes my presentation on imaging signs and on minis and neuroradiology we've seen a lot of them let's summarize or let's get uh, try to distill some key points out of this presentation well i think it should be clear that radiological signs can be very helpful to recognize certain pathological entities uh, they can also help us recognize certain structures in the brain however we should also not overrate their usefulness and their pathognomonic character. Keep in mind that radiological signs and old minis belong to the so-called um, uh, first system of a visual analysis and cognitive thinking. It's fast, but it's prone to errors. So a bit overrated. So be skeptical or be critical. Some, however, can be, in my opinion, very reliable for a specific diagnosis. If I see lateral ventricle shape like this, I know I'm going to see some kind of dysgenesis of the corpus callosum on the sagittal image. If I see this image on uh, uh, a T1 weighted image with gadolinium, I know there's going to be a, develop a developmental venous anomaly just because, well, it just looks like that. Um, we see like the caput medusae sign and a lot of snakes on the head of medusa. So then there are some signs that maybe they aren't 100% pathognomonic. They can nevertheless be very helpful for finding the right diagnosis because these signs are associated with very rare diseases that you wouldn't automatically think about. Like for instance, the panda sign and Wilson disease, the onion bulb sign and Barlow's concentric sclerosis, the cascade sign and Bechet disease, and the eye of the tiger sign and um, pantotonate kinase deficiency. And then we have some signs that, in my opinion, are unreliable and sometimes even confusing and often incorrectly used, like the Mickey Mouse sign for progressive supranuclear palsy, even the hummingbird sign for supranuclear palsy. And we have the swallowtail sign. I didn't even discuss it because I believe it is so difficult and so subjective that I don't find it all that reliable and useful. Also something to keep in mind is that there is a lot of redundancy in the world of science. It's tempting if you are confronted with a case and if you, you know, look at it from a certain angle, you can recognize maybe a pig snout or a monkey or all eyes in it to say, let's publish this as a new radiological sign. Oh, yeah. Okay, then we end up with like six sides for the same entity. How useful is that? It becomes a bit confusing in my experience. It's uh, okay. It's also 
gives rise to like fun presentations. You can make fun presentations of them, but you know, I, I sometimes question the utility. The same is true for colossal agenesis, moose head, steer horn, Texas longhorn, even Viking helmet all to describe the same imaging appearance. And then we have a problem of textical ambiguity that sometimes we have like the same sign that can be used for two different entities. For instance, we have two string of pearl signs in the radiology, one to describe fibromuscular dysplasia and one to describe internal watershed infarctions. Or we have two uh, al eye signs, one to describe central pontine myelinolysis, but, and I'm just, I didn't add it in the cases because it's more spinal and I try to limit the number of spinal cases, but it's also a sign described to describe spinal infarction involving the anterior horns of the gray matter and can also be seen in certain infectious disease of the spinal cord like polio or poliolite disorders. So, okay, let's say that uh, these signs can be helpful, but we should use them with, uh, we should be a little bit critical when we use them. Also keep in mind that nothing is 100% certain, not in medicine, not in radiology. Medicine, as William Osler uh, famously said, is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. Now, he, this is a very interesting article. Uh, I borrowed a bit from it. The, the authors here only discussed about 10 signs, but they gave, in my opinion, a very critical and also a quite fun to read, made a fun to read article about the utility and the use of descriptive neuroradiology uh, signs. And there's even a complete book. I have a copy of it. I find it a very fun book. Because as said, it's, you, know, you can be critical about the use of signs, but they're a good way sometimes to teach things. Yeah. So I hope you found this presentation useful. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you know how to reach me. You can send me an email, theradiology.online at gmail.com. I'm way behind in replying, I have to admit, however, but I do try to do that. So every now and then I make some time to reply to my emails, uh, or you can just leave a comment in the comment section. I hope you found it interesting. It's way too long. I didn't even discuss all the signs out there. I even made a selection, but I'm very bad at you know, kill your darlings, like William Faulkner said. I'm very bad at that. So I always make these presentations way too long. So thank you very much for watching.